begin by announcing some of our upcoming events. Um, you know, when, when COVID uh, came around, we of course basically shut down doing events. We couldn't do events anymore. We did some on Zoom and that sort of thing. Uh, and then once COVID was began to be, we think, uh, when it began to ease up, we started getting back to our events, and uh, it's, uh, you know, it's taken us a while to get there uh, and to get back to normal, but I can see, due to our calendar now, that it's really starting to look like kind of the good old days. Um, tomorrow, Lee Durkee, uh, another writer who lives here in Oxford, uh, is going to be here with his book, Stalking Shakespeare. Uh, it's a memoir about his session with Shakespeare and Shakespeare's portraiture. And there was a review in yesterday's New York Times by the uh, director of the Globe Theater in England, uh, which was a very uh, positive review. Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting and fun book. And uh, that will be the same time tomorrow uh, here at 5.30. Lee Durkee with Stalking Shakespeare. Uh, Thursday, uh, <coughs> Thacker Mountain will be at the Powerhouse. And the guest author will be Frank Bill, who has a novel called Back to the Dirt. Uh, on Friday, we're going to have a reception, not a not a speaking or reading event, just a reception, uh, meet and greet for uh, Peter Osnos at four o'clock at the main store. Peter Osnos is a has been in the book uh, business or or working as a journalist his whole life. He's in his uh, I think maybe upper seventies now, and. Um, he was the founder of Public Affairs Press, a, a, a very uh, excellent press that did all sorts of books and about uh, public affairs, you know, government. And, um, he was also a, a editor at Random House and published uh, biographies of uh, Bill Clinton and uh, I think four different presidents. So anyway, that's, that's at 4 o'clock if you want to come by and say hi to Peter Osnos. And he's got two fairly recent books, one on the Helsinki Accords and another one I can't quite remember exactly what it's about, but it's in the, it's in the uh, political science sphere. Uh, and then on Saturday, uh, Grace Valentine will be here at Off Square Books with a devotional or for for young women called the 90-day devotional. And that's at 11 a.m. We're going with some odd times here <laughs> you know, on Saturday. And then next week, on Tuesday, Michael Ferris Smith, who's a writer who lives here in Oxford, he's originally from Macomb, Mississippi, uh, is going to be here uh, with his new novel, Salvage This World. And then Thursday of next week, on Thacker Mountain, uh, radio again at the powerhouse. That'll be the last show of the of the season. Uh, Tom Piazza, who's been here uh, several times in the past years, uh, will be here with his new novel called The Auburn Concert, and that I'm told is about Auburn, New York, not Auburn, Alabama. <laughs> so that's uh, a lot going on just within the next couple of weeks. But today we're here for Heather McTeer Tony. Very happy to have her and uh, have her with her first book. Congratulations, Heather. Uh, we spent a little time this morning while she signed some, some books. Uh, Before the Street Lights Come On, Black America's Urgent Call for Climate Solutions. Um, she is the, the former mayor of Greenville, Mississippi. Uh, she was elected at the age of 27. Uh, I was almost twice that before they elected me. Uh, she was appointed by uh, President Obama as regional minister, administrator for the EPA's uh, Southeast region. So she's uh, dealt in this uh, 
environmental protection uh, sphere for some time now and uh, knows what she's talking about here. So we're thrilled to have her uh, here uh, today and uh, to have her here in Oxford. Um, I'm always happy when there's another lawyer in town. And uh, <clears throat> she's here with her husband, uh, Dexter, and her two, two children, uh, Devin, who's at Bramlett School here in Oxford, and uh, Dariah, who's at Oxford High School. So, without anything further, I'll cut the welcome and I turn the program to you. and a special thank you to Square Books for making this happen. Uh, to be here at, at home, able to just get up and drive over or be driven over by my husband <laughs> uh, is really special. Uh, I cannot tell you how excited I am that this book is a reality and that it's a reality that we're all sharing and at a time where it is so important to talk about climate and climate change. So thank you for coming out. Thank you for buying the book. Thank you for being a part of this. Happy Earth Week, because that's what today is kicking off, and it's really important um, that we're having this conversation. This book would not exist if it were not for the three people sitting on this front row. Um, my husband, Dexter, the little one, Devin, <laughs> and, and Dariah who dealt with countless evenings of me being away and writing, of me taking time to ponder, think, fuss, be frustrated at, and to go through this process over and over and over again. I love you more than you know. And when you get the book, you'll see at the very beginning of it, the book is actually to my children. Because it's for them that I do this work. And it's really for all of our communities and children everywhere that we focus on climate and environmental issues. And so it's very important that I constantly acknowledge and keep them at the forefront because that's the reason I write. Um, it's the reason that talking about this issue of environment and climate is so critical to every single aspect of our life. And I wanted to bring a different perspective of it. And so I also want to thank uh, a number of others before I really dig in. First of all, thank you to everyone who's tuned in online and watching us. Is this a, I think, click and reshare? I think I said that right. <laughs> um, I really appreciate people taking out the time to all of my sorority sisters from Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. Thank you so much for being tremendously supportive and everyone in the Oxford community. Our church family at Oxford United Methodist, the schools, everyone who probably sees me and knows me mostly from running around as Devin and Dariah's mom, um, <laughs> I am greatly appreciative. I want to start by answering one question that I probably get asked most, more than anything else. It is, Heather, what do you do? Uh, what actually do you do every day? <clears throat> so up until last week, <laughs> my job was as the Vice President of Community Engagement at the Environmental Defense Fund. And I've worked in the space of environment and climate for almost 20 years now, realizing that it is because of the connections on community that so often we have missed the importance of seeing our work every single day. Last week I changed jobs and became the Executive Director for Beyond Petrochemicals for the Bloomberg, uh, Bloomberg Philanthropies. So a different group, but same focus and still in partnership to do the one thing of ensuring that we don't continue to see environmental injustices across our country. It's really special to do this and be from Mississippi, and let me tell you why. <laughs> there are so many times I have gone to places and they're like, you're from where? <laughs> Black folks don't care about climate change. What are you talking about? You mean people in Mississippi know how to spell climate change? <laughs> Seriously? And those are the questions that I really love and dig into because it is so important that people from our part of the country understand that we're probably closer, closely, more closely connected to climate and environment than a lot of people are. It is so ingrained into our everyday experience that you deal with it and don't even realize it. 
I have learned more about climate and environment just from talking to hunters about the fact that they have snakes in their deer stand at different times of the year versus when they had it when their grandmother or grandfather was out hunting. Or how people talk about what is growing, when it's growing, how it's growing, how the seasons have changed and moved and what that means. And God help you if you are from the Mississippi Delta and grew up in a Baptist church where you're not supposed to wear white after Labor Day <laughs> or before Easter and you are hot in January. So all of these nuances that make up what and how we have our lived experience in climate is really what I wanted to bring to this conversation, but particularly for the black community. Because again, so many times I would come into situations and people would say, but black people don't care about climate change. That's not a black issue. In fact, it was one time that I was watching MSNBC and Tiffany Cross, who I absolutely love and adore, said that climate was a bougie black thing. And I was like, oh, Tiffany, <laughs> no, it's not. And since that time, it's been wonderful to see how people have understood and connected to these things that we draw upon each and every day. And so in writing, I wrote about all of the places where I saw connections to climate solutions that were a part of our social justice issues that we were facing. I wrote about the experience of connecting and witnessing the murders of George Floyd, Ahmaud Aubrey, and Breonna Taylor, and how climate was an accomplice to that because of heat, and how historically throughout our communities we have experienced extreme heat more so than other neighborhoods and communities simply because being surrounded by concrete and non-impervious surfaces or the places that don't absorb heat and not having trees and not having parks makes it hot. It makes it hot for the people who live in the communities but even more so for the police officers that are wearing all black and having to patrol these mm -hmm. communities. And so I wrote about not only how that felt, but how it felt as being a black mother of a black son, sons, and wife to a black husband. And how we feel significant pain when watching the crisis take place worldwide, knowing that we're also working on climate and environmental issues at the same time that exasperate that problem. I wrote about voting. In fact, one of the things that you'll find in the book is every single section has to do items at the end because we all need something to do. So many people ask, well, what do I do? What is my space? So I made it a point at the end of every chapter to give you at least five things you could do. And then at the end of the book, a compilation of things that we can all do together to act more on climate that don't seem so out of whack. I wrote about faith because I come from a Christian household and am a Christian woman. And I just strongly believe that you can't have a copyright on Jesus. Hmm. And so I found it very important to write about the connections that I found between my faith and climate action and the call to action for creation care, our responsibility to care for both the people and the planet. What is our responsibility? I'm going to read a section for you, and the section that I chose to read is a section that I hope you enjoy because it has to do with food. In fact, the very first place that I wrote was for the New York Times and for a young woman by the name of Debbie Lockwood, who started as a, uh, a, a editor fellow for the New York Times, but she wanted to make sure that she was elevating people of color and voices of color. And so she convinced me to write a piece for the New York Times. Uh, and the, night, the name of that piece eventually ended up in another book called All We Could Save. And it was Collars Are Just As Good As Kale. <laughs> so in the book, I have a, uh, a chapter that I wrote about food. <clears throat> and it's called The Cultural Appropriation of Collard Greens. Food insecurity and the climate crisis. And the reason I thought this would not only be appropriate, um, when just being in and around Oxford, I see 
how much passion this community has for caring for people, from the food pantry to the farmer's market to the places where we have gardens, we talk about it all the time. We are sitting inside of Off Square Books where you could probably find just about any food or gardening book that you wanted somewhere on these shelves, and if not, they could probably order it for you. But our connection to land and to food and to air and to agriculture, it is woven into everything that we are and that we have. It's what makes us smile, it brings us joy, and some of us have a few extra pounds on our hips because we like butter and we like to eat good. <laughs> so connecting that to the climate crisis, particularly for our community, the black community, was important because there are parts of the climate crisis that call upon us to reduce certain parts of our food. And it's a challenge. How many times I have heard scientists say, well, we all have to be vegan, we all have to be vegetarian, and I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to go into my local church and tell them we cannot have chicken or we can't have bacon on the salad. That's going to be a problem in the salad. And it, it's what causes these lines of division versus identifying innovation and in ways that maybe we can slow some of the things that we need to slow down without excluding everyone. And so that's what I wrote about. And if you'll allow me a little bit, I'd like to read you a portion of it. This is chapter seven, <clears throat> the cultural appropriation of collard greens, food insecurity, and the climate crisis. I do not like green eggs and ham. I do not like them, Sam, I am. <laughs> the big yellow guy in green eggs and ham. While visiting Sarasota, Florida, my husband agreed to join me in doing something I absolutely love and, com and completely unrelated to work, it's foot massages. We found a quaint little spot in a quiet retirement community. It wasn't overly glamorous, average-sized homes with small meat yards and the random golf cart illegally riding along the city street. With a few minutes to spare, we saw a shopping plaza with a health food-based grocery store and decided to stop in. It took less than two minutes for us to realize we were not in a regular store. Babe, you see this? I tried to quietly whisper in my shop as we walked through the fresh vegetable section. He smirked knowing full well where I was about to go. What'd you expect? Look at where we are. I pretended to clutch invisible pearls. Dex, this bundle of collard greens is $5.99. Five whole dollars and 99 whole cents. I held up the thin bundle of organic greens by the stalk. There was more stalk than green, but the wrapper on the green twist tie proudly proclaimed organic and locally grown. Dude, there are only three leaves on this thing. What in God's green earth can you do with three collard green leaves? Who is eating three greens? <laughs> Without missing a beat, my spouse, best friend, and partner in crime pointed to the tofu in the next session of the store and responded, somebody trying to make a collard green wrap with this stuff. <laughs> I burst into laughter. Both my husband and I were born in Greenville, Mississippi, a place frequently referred to as the heart of the Mississippi Delta. We playfully banter with each other about who spent the most time in the gardens of grandmothers and godmothers. He always wins. His grandfather had a farm with pigs and chickens, a tractor, and rows and rows of homegrown vegetables. He gets PTSD whenever anyone speaks of picking, let alone eating okra. <laughs> Whether they be mustards, collards, or turnip greens, they have always been a staple in our diet. Sunday dinners were not complete without a pot of greens. Coming home from college with friends, they got greens in a carefully frozen, lovingly foil-wrapped dish to take back to school. At every funeral repast, there was a section of the white paper plate reserved for greens, cornbread, and if you're lucky, a sliver of ham hock. Dexter and I picked greens out of backyards, bought them off the back of flatbed trucks, pulled over on the side of the road, and have stripped leafy greens from their stem. We can eyeball how many bundles of greens it takes to feed a family of four or a family reunion of 100. Between the two of us, we have well over 80 years of greens experience. <laughs> and like two middle school kids, we spent the rest of the time in the store trying our best not to draw attention from the store clerks as we snickered, giggled, and snorted about the insanity of $5.99 bundle of greens. 
My husband's assessment of the who and why of 599 collard greens was not far from the truth. The rhetoric often heard from environmentalists and climate advocates is that moving to a vegan or vegetarian diet is one of the best ways we can take individual action to save the planet. We've already established that a major factor of global warming and climate change is human activity that increases heat trapping gases. If we're going to be effective in fighting climate change, then we must reduce this activity in every way. After fossil fuels, deforestation, and food production are the biggest emitters of heat trapping gases. We cannot achieve climate stabilization without changing entire food systems from beginning to end and feeding, feeding livestock completely through package and distribution channels. Individual action alone won't cut it. To avoid further catastrophic impacts from global warming, like wildfires, floods, heat waves, and drought, we have to work together to change how we produce food while cutting our meat intake at the same time. Uh, that is the beginning of the chapter of food and climate crisis. And throughout that chapter, I go on to talk about things like the environmental poverty tax. Most people know what an EBT is, the electronic benefits card that people use for SNAP. But I talk about the environmental poverty tax that so many people are impacted by. The fact that if you don't have clean water to drink, that only not impacts how much you have to pay for plastic bottled water that's also detrimental to our climate. But it means that for those people who have a skin condition and now have to buy special soap or special lotion because they can't take a bath in that water. Or the cost of simply going to the grocery store. Whereas most of us can run in and out of Kroger in our cars, there's so many people who are not only impacted because they live in food deserts, places where they can't get fresh food, but also because of the extreme weather increases, it means that tornadoes and hurricanes that come along completely wipe out the electric infrastructure so there's no energy in these spaces. It means that a mom who's trying to get to the grocery store and has to take her kids with her because she doesn't have childcare, that adds to the cost. It means that even in the safe spaces we find, particularly in the black community, where we have our grocery stores, like so many other communities around this country, but then there are people who drive hours to come and shoot up a grocery store, makes us not feel comfortable in the spaces that we have. So to be included and the amount of money that you pay for food is a part of that climate crisis as well. And these are the things that we have to talk about and that we have to connect. I will stop with this, and if there are questions, I'm happy to answer them. I try to infuse hope throughout this entire book because there's enough climate despair that's out there. You don't need another person telling us we're going to hell in a handbasket. <laughs> what we do need are people who are willing to find innovative and creative ways to solve the problem and to listen to different groups about the solutions that currently exist. And there are so many of them. I am more than excited and enthused about my daughter's generation and the generations coming because they're figuring out how to look at climate and environmental issues in the metaverse. They're using social media to talk about how we can move and make significant change. They're creating pathways that make sure that things like the methane that comes out of cows, the reason why people want to get rid of all of the meat, they're just creating gas sets for cows and identifying really new ways that we can solve the climate crisis. They are the embodiment of sustainability and resiliency. And I couldn't be more excited about it because hopefully we'll get a chance to retire somewhere on a beach that still exists. <laughs> and it's so important that we're investing into young people to make sure that their pathways are solid. So I'm going to stop with that. I am beyond thrilled that you come out, that you've spent time, that you will get a copy of the book, read the book, and then take some of the actions at the end of the book. Share it with friends, with family, 
Take pictures, post it on social media, share your actions, normalize talking about climate, and normalize talking about the environment. And above everything else, vote. Because that is what will make such a significant difference in what we are able to do both now and in the future. Thank you. In your environmental justice work, how do you go about establishing trust with the communities that you work with so that you can have these open questions and conversations? I love that question. Thank you. The question was in environmental justice work, how do I go about establishing trust in communities so that we're able to do some of the work that we do and that's such an important thing because so many people go into communities and don't establish trust. In the book I talk about um, what's called a three meeting method. Uh, I think that you have to have at least three meetings with communities. The first is just to listen, to be present and to listen, to identify in space and show up as someone who's willing to learn and take in what is happening in that community in that space. The second meeting you go to typically is where people are trying to figure out who you are. Why are you here? Why are you showing back up? What do you want or what can you give? And that is really important to both identify space but also connection with people to let them know you're going to come back. The third meeting is where you actually work. It's not in the first two. The first two meetings are simply getting to know you spaces and helping people become acclimated to being comfortable with someone new being in their space. Showing up that third time means that you're actually committed, that you'll come back, that you'll show up, that you're not dissuaded, and I think a continued pattern of that. And it's important to know that people of all backgrounds have to do it. I have to do that anytime I am going into an indigenous community in uh, out west or if I am in the northeast and <clears throat> in different parts of D.C. or New York because they don't know me. Uh, and, and establishing that has been vitally important. So one of the, the question is, you know, what, how, do you, how do we deal with companies trying to dissuade black communities, and I'll go just so far to say poor communities, period, all over yes. the country, um, from investing in climate. And it's one of the reasons why I took the job that I have now. Right now, there are roughly 120 manufacturing companies across this country that are trying to do exactly that in communities that are already vulnerable. And uh, a great example is in South Louisiana. If anybody's familiar with Cancer Alley, it's a stretch mm -hmm. of River, Mississippi River that's completely inundated with oil and gas and petrochemical facilities. And the rate of cancer in that community is so high that they've just renamed it Cancer Alley. Mm -hmm. And in that community, they've not only fought out additional plants coming in, but they have been trying to install solar as a renewable energy source for their community. And they had pushback time after time. I went down to see, well, what is going on? And it was amazing that I drove into parts of the community where the industry was offsetting the cost of housing. You gotta picture this. Beautiful apartments, single family dwellings with solar on the roof. That a 1200 foot square, square foot apartment, two bedroom, uh, garage might cost you $350 a month. How 
do you combat that? And that's where it's so important for us to talk about what are not only the health impacts, but also what are the economic impactors really? Is that job really a job if you're only gonna live 50 years versus 75 or the 80 that your grandmother and great grandmother lived on? Is it really worth it if you can't use the land and property that has been passed down from generation to generation because the land is no longer any good for anything? It doesn't grow anything. Um, and it's toxic. And some of these spaces, like in South Louisiana, they're now finding that there are burial grounds that these industries have been sitting on top of or are trying to take over. So developing this information, I think, is so important, as well as continuing to push to have renewable energy sources like solar. South Louisiana is getting offshore wind, which is great, and things that will help to continue to make sure that they're sustainable communities. So I'm, uh, that's one I'm, I'm, I'm glad to see continuing going. That was a question right behind you. Yes. Um, glad you're pushing voting, because um, we see every election, it seems like there's fewer and fewer voter turnout, local, national. Um, so two questions. One, beyond just voting, as a former mayor, how do you inspire others to do what you did? And maybe you wouldn't, but um, I think I'm also discouraged by the fact that often elections are unopposed and you don't really have a choice or the choices are so similar, you're, 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 yeah, you don't have a choice. Yeah. And then the second part to that is, as a former mayor of a community, what locally can we do policy-wise that could advance climate uh, improvements? Because it's such a big issue, what things can cities and towns do? So I'm going to take the second part of that first and then go into the first, first question. Um, there is a huge need for people to sit in all positions, including appointed positions. And that is one of the places that we don't step into with a climate lens, and we really need to. So whether it is, most people think like when you, if you're a climate or environmentalist, then you're going to go and be on the Parks and Recreation Committee, or you want to be on the tree board. We want to push back against that narrative a little bit, because every position that is appointed position on a local or a state level has the opportunity to both influence the policy and the funding for climate initiatives. So it's just as important to be on the infrastructure, the planning commission, um, the library commission where you have the ability to speak to how funds are spent to improve infrastructure with respect to climate and environment as well as policy. So that's one of the first places that is a little known secret that oftentimes uh, in my work we go first to look at how many open seats are there in a community. How many seats are there on a court commission? We, we actually did this assessment about three months ago where we looked at the major courts in the United States, Houston, uh, Chicago, out in California, Newark, New Jersey, all places that are um, governed by minority either leaders or significant parts of their council structure. And we just counted how many seats were open on the court commission because we knew billions of dollars were about to flow through courts for electrification and immediately just started asking all of those leaders Make sure you are appointing people who have an environmental justice lens or background and giving them guidelines to help make sure that they're thinking through that when they're appointing people. Now you're looking at a position where you've got people sitting in board courts and commissions um, that are controlling money that can talk about and think about what's the air pollution that is going to be created when we're sending trucks through these ports, right? Because that's the space that they didn't get elected to. They were simply appointed to. And I think we should look at that on a local level from a uh, city level, county level, and a state level. That leads to the second part of your question was, well, how do you not just get discouraged when it doesn't seem like there's anybody running? Politics are cyclical. And we, we go through cycles every four to eight years. And it's also cycles of generations. And part of the issue that I think we are beginning to understand better is the way that you insert yourself into that cycle sometimes can come from these appointed positions. If you just look at the trajectory of people who are in higher places in office, 
sometimes. It's not because they started out and they were elected. I did it the crazy route, running for office really, really young, <laughs> not knowing what you don't know. But there are pathways, I think, to getting into breaking these cycles. We just have to be a part of it consistently and to understand it's not a, it's not a problem when you ask people and let's say, if they say, no, I don't want to run, it's piqued something in their interest. And now we can say, well, will you serve in this particular position? Will you be an appointed party? Will you help to encourage other people in and around you to turn out to vote? It happens over time. We have to understand, I think, how to engage in all parts of that cycle. Yes, sir. Uh, I know in Oxford we have like a tree board and a historic preservation commission. And, but I don't know that we've got a, an environmental policy uh, body mm -hmm. of, of, uh, of, of uh, volunteers who, who work together to talk through some of these local issues. Do you know of any places in Mississippi whose local governments have uh, any kind of a official group that works just on climate or environmental policy? If I'm not mistaken, Biloxi and Gulfport had the closest thing to that that was pulled together after Hurricane Katrina mm -hmm. to help ensure that the rebuild was sustainable. Uh, I don't know if it's still in existence, though, but that would be the closest, closest I would think to it. A lot of the Mississippi the towns and cities um, started with climate action plans and, and making sure that in an emergency response, you also have a climate response to that. And then are now growing from that to be more inclusive about how do we talk about sustainable uh, opportunities, especially with so much funding coming down. Um, we have a ways to go in that space. We just, we just do. But maybe even to, you know, Daniel, what you were saying, um, it is not so much as having a separate entity as it is weaving climate and environment into every single part, every single board, not just the tree board, but the school board, because these are places where people are influencing the policy and the funding. I can't stress that enough. The people who are voting on where money is going are extremely and sometimes more important. Um, when I was at Region 4, I had, so, backstory, I, I was mayor for eight years. I ran for time, was lost horribly, but it caught the attention of the federal government and President Obama. It's like, this kid has got some spunk. Okay, what can you do? And I was put then into a position where I was in charge of eight states, the entire Southeast a budget that was a half billion dollar budget and more than a thousand employees for region four, a quarter of the nation's population. And I was the person responsible for not only overseeing that, but ensuring that environmental justice was woven into it. That's a pretty powerful position to be in. And there's so many of those posts and positions all across the state. Not just the policy, but also really working with states Got into a lot of interesting conversations with Mississippi and Alabama, as you could probably imagine. And my daughter loved being able to say that Region 4 had Disney World and, um, you know, getting uh, to do some of that. I think we did Disney World. Yeah, we did. Okay. Um, so all of these are, you know, aspects that we miss. And if we could begin to really understand the full weight and power of some of these roles, my gosh just sending requests. A lot of times we send requests of work. Um, you, there's a, there's a initiative that we want to see done in the state of Mississippi, so you send it to all of your state representatives to the governor's office. And you know, you might think, why am I sending this to the governor's office? He's not going to read it. But there's a whole slew of people that you miss out on that we don't send the information to that actually can push buttons really, really fast. So the head of the Department of Transportation well, Secretary Buttigieg has regional administrators for the Department of Transportation all over this country, and they influence a lot of money. EPA, HUD, Secretary of Agriculture, all of these people, have, all of these offices have
have appointed personnel that are really dictating a lot of what happens in our spaces. So let's not leave them off the board. Because I can tell you firsthand, from when I was in Region 4, there were people in my office every single day that wanted to make sure they knew where that half billion dollars was being spent and whether or not it was being spent in their communities. Yes, sir. social media love um, to show the, the Mississippi love. I'm going to step out from the higher. Um, so the, to your first question, things specific to Mississippi, the Mississippi River, Mississippi River, Mississippi River, and the importance of the river to industry, to agriculture, to jobs throughout this country cannot be uh, delineated in any way, shape, form, or fashion. Every time there is an extreme weather event and our river gets hit, it's not only hitting farmers in the South Delta region, but up the entire Mississippi River chain. So two years ago when we had extreme uh, flooding in the Mississippi uh, Delta region, and you had farmers that not only had complete um, a complete crop loss, that flooding, of course, went all the way up Barges could not come down the river. We ended up with farmers that were up in Iowa who could not put their product on the barges. As a result of that, the product then gets uh, into silos. The silos were overrun, and then you had uh, product that was then left out in the fields rotting. So just from the extreme weather of what happened and impacts in the Mississippi River, the entire nation, you probably didn't know exactly why the beef prices were going up, but that's one of the reasons why. So uh, the part of Mississippi that is so critical to our entire country's infrastructure and transportation sits right along our, our Delta region. The way that our levees are protected is, is, again, another vital, important piece. And when we saw the tornadoes that came over about three weeks ago, if you're from the Delta like I am, I don't know if there are any other Delta people in here, we sort of had this thing that you, you would think, uh, I know some folks are grieving in the room, but you, you should amen if, you, if I write it out. You sort of, you grew up thinking that, okay, the tornado comes across from Arkansas, it's going to hit the levee and bounce. <laughs> right? we, we grew up believing that, that it was, if it was coming over from Arkansas, then it was going to hit that levee and it was going to bounce up and over us. And Lord knows how many prayer sessions we went to. And, you know, sure enough, we would get... We would get bounced over, but what nobody really told us was that as the storm strengthened mm -hmm. and you have storms that are sitting more water in the storm, mm -hmm. it's not that it's just bouncing over, but storms move slower mm -hmm. and there's more water in the storm, which means we get hit harder with the amount of water that sits and is saturated in our communities. Mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons why you see these major sinkholes. If you've driven through the Delta, can't figure out why the ground just cracks, it's because the ground cannot take as much water as it has. And that impacts Mississippi differently than other parts of the country because our ground is so, so fertile in the Delta. Um, it's what makes it so susceptible to climate impacts. So I hope that's an example that's very specific to Mississippi. I think another one is along the Gulf Coast area where we have significant um, impact to tourism. 
as well as to the shrimping and oyster industry every single time there's an extreme weather event that comes across. And um, how many of us remember the BP oil spill? Mm -hmm. I, I had just been appointed to a new post at that time, so that was my fire, um, learning how to handle. But these are things that are specific to our community that people are actually looking at us to take lessons from. So I often um, work globally um, with international climate conversations from communities that are very much like Mississippi. They're coastal, they're rural, they're impoverished, they're farmlands. And they're looking oftentimes to see, well, how did you all resolve this problem? Or are these issues very similar to what we are dealing with on the coast of Nigeria or um, in Ghana uh, or in India? places that are also just as susceptible as we are here in Mississippi. I think your second question uh, was about new job. But uh, beyond petrochemicals, so that is a Bloomberg initiative. Mike Bloomberg has been extraordinary in really getting at the forefront of major climate so, initiatives. So, so, and uh, so similar to Beyond Coal, which was uh, uh, effort to shut down fossil fuel and coal plants. Uh, beyond Carbon is another one. Beyond Petrochemicals is to help us to push back against plastics. Petrochemicals is basically, it's the stuff that plastic is made out of. But a lot of times we have plastics that's just, what I think of is unnecessary. It's, it's pointless plastics. The example that um, I use, so I do a show called Pattern on the Weather Channel. It's, uh, I'm usually there every Wednesday or every other Wednesday, I think. Um, but this past week, we were in studio just really talking about how you don't need that little plastic window that's in front of the spaghetti on the spaghetti box. Like, have you ever thought about why do they have that little plastic window there? Like, does anybody not know what spaghetti looks like? <laughs> but that's an example of pointless plastic. That's an example of places where we find plastic completely unnecessary, but there's an industry that is com that is poisoning and really killing communities because they keep telling us that we need these plastics. Now they're telling us about something called chemical recycling, that we need advanced recycling, basically to burn the plastics to make more plastic. And these are um, uh, industries that are not only already poisoning people, they're trying to sort of do a bait and switch with us to tell us, oh, it's just recycling. No, it's really not. Because we don't need the little plastic window that's in front of the spaghetti. We really don't. This is just a way to make more money, but it keeps um, communities, again, continuing to suffer from extreme environmental injustices. Um, so that's what I now do. I get to talk about that. Uh, as you can well imagine, the oil and gas and petrochemical industries are very, very well funded, so it makes my job <laughs> extremely interesting. Um, but it's one well worth the fight, absolutely well worth the fight. Yay! Well, I am ecstatic, you all. It is to not have been more than what I had ever thought about. Um, dreamed of. I get to talk about these issues a lot <laughs> in my day day to day being able to do around people who you get it. We're from the same space. We live in Mississippi. We're concerned about our climate and our children and our planet and our environment just as much as anybody else is. And I am so proud to be able to do this as a native Mississippian, as a woman of faith, as a black woman who uh, is well-educated and can speak just as well as anybody else on these issues, it does me very proud to be able to stand here and to do this right in Oxford, the place that I now live and that I do love. Still from the Mississippi Delta. <laughs> <laughs> Play the great deal all day.